I will never be more loved than I am right now. Wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now.
Hey guys, welcome. My name is Stephen. I'm senior pastor here at Cokesbury Church, and wherever you're joining us from, we're really glad that you guys are here. I want to give a special uh, welcome to our campus in Johnson City. I love you guys. Hope you all are doing well. I want to start with a question today, and it's a simple question. Have you ever thrown your back out? Like, I mean, really thrown your back out. I've had off and on back trouble since I was in high school. And I've since found out that according to people who are a lot smarter than I am, that most of my issues are linked to a sprained rib. Apparently, once you pop a rib out, it never fully heals, and so it can cause problems over the years. And this first became uh, a legit issue, like where I realized it was going to be a chronic deal. I was over in the sanctuary on a Saturday getting things ready for worship the next day, and we had this altar rail. It was in three pieces. It's made out of wood, and it's really heavy. And I noticed when I walked in, it was off center, and so I wanted to make things right. And so I was literally going to move it like three inches. And so when I bent over and I picked up uh, that altar rail, that's when it happened. And y'all, I'm talking like next level pain. I'm talking about felt like fire shooting up my spine, my back locked up. I was actually bent over and couldn't stand up straight. I could barely take in a deep breath, and I didn't know what to do. I, I couldn't, I could barely move, and so there was nobody else here. I didn't have a cell phone with me, and I didn't know how I was going to get out of that situation. In fact, I wound up crawling <laughs> all the way to the back of the sanctuary on my hands and knees, and I found a wheelchair, and I was able to get myself up in the wheelchair, and then slowly, just using my feet, kind of walk myself to the front where I could get to a phone. I mean, it was ridiculous, well, this pain went on for like three days. Um, getting a bowl of cereal was like a straight up major ordeal. And the frustrating thing is I was 26 years old. But in that moment, I felt like, look, I'm old, I'm dying, my life, it's done. I could not believe how much it affected my life. Well, a couple of days after that, a friend of mine was like, Stephen, you need to go see a chiropractor and let them work on you a little bit. And so I go and I see this guy and he's like, all right, look, your back is out of alignment, right? Like your body's trying to heal itself, but your back is all jacked up and it's not, it's not the way it's supposed to be. And so first we got to get everything back in line and then your body can start to heal itself. And I was like, great, I'll do whatever you need me to do to make the pain stop. And so he's like, well, lay down on this table. And so I laid down and he proceeded to take my neck, right? And he does things to my neck that should never be done to a person's neck. And this is what I love. He's like, just relax, right? Like, just relax. And I don't know if you've ever been in a tremendous amount of pain, but it is an impossibility to relax. In fact, it's very condescending and frustrating when someone on the other side of that pain tells you to relax. I could not relax. And so, sure enough, I was able to take a couple of deep breaths and I got my neck snapped, right? It's adjusted. Like, he pushes and he pulls and he gets everything back in alignment. And as I stood up, I was still hurting. And I remember walking out and he's like, look, you're a lot better aligned. Come back in a couple of days. We'll do this again. And we're going to keep you in alignment so that your body can heal itself. Now, here's what I noticed. Once I got aligned, the pain started to slowly go away. Once I got aligned, things started to come back in my life. Like I started to regain strength and I started to regain power and I, I was able to regain the ability to, to do the simple things that I'd not been able to do just a couple of days earlier. Once I got aligned, a lot of the problems in my life started to take care of themselves. Now, I've been thinking about that experience a lot lately. Because spiritually, we all go through pain in our life. Some of us, I would argue right now in this moment, we're walking around with the pain of loneliness or uh, maybe the pain of discouragement or maybe you're facing a setback. Maybe you're just in that season of life where there's all kinds of frustrations going on. And while that pain may be very real, some of us may be in more pain than we need to be simply because we're out of alignment, if you will, with the spiritual priorities that God has for each of our lives. Here's what I know. When you're out of alignment, you end up experiencing a lot more pain than you need to. And I think this happens not only in individuals, but I think it can even happen in churches. So we're in this teaching series that we're calling Recapturing the Awesome. And we've been talking about this idea that if we can change our attitude, 
we can change our life. That if you adjust your perspective on how you see the world and the events going on around you, when you change your perspective about the stuff that you're facing in your own personal life, you can end up changing your life. Today, I wanna carry that a little further and talk about aligning our lives with God's purpose. In fact, I bullet it down this way. When it comes to our purpose, for those of us that are following Jesus, it is very simple. You and I are rescued to be a rescuer, right? We are rescued to be a rescuer. If you're a follower, God has done a work in your life, right? Think about it. God has forgiven you. God has helped you. God has walked beside you. God has been faithful to you. And God has not abandoned you yet. And the reason, ultimately, is so that you can also be used through your story and through your life to help rescue other people. I want to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 today. It's written by the Apostle Paul. And he's writing to a group of Christians and he kind of simplifies everything and gives the early believers their purpose statement, if you will, in a pretty compact few words. So if you've got a copy of the scriptures, it's 1 Corinthians chapter five. If not, it's gonna be right there on the screen with, uh, for you. It's, it is a great power pack kind of deal. Check this out, 1 Corinthians chapter five, verse 16. Paul says, so we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has become. Now, this is rich. Because basically what Paul is saying is, if you belong to Christ, like if you've put your faith and your trust in Jesus, the old life, the old you, that stuff is now gone. And here's the reality. You may still feel the effects from it. You may still be haunted by the memories of it. You may still hold on to some of the patterns that you used to follow. That stuff may still be present in your life. But according to Paul, the old you, ultimately, that's gone. And the new you is what God is bringing forth and through your life. Think about it. God is working in your life. God is moving in your life. Your past is not your future. It does not get to determine where you're going. What happened back there, it may be a chapter in your story, but it is not the final story. That old life, that old you, like the anger or the frustration or the loneliness or just the sheer meanness, all of that stuff, the old you, most days, is gone. Now you've stepped into a new you that version of you that God has actually created you to be. And here's what I know. As you and I grow in our faith, as we continue to take our next steps, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will bring about certain characteristics, if you will, um, referred to as the fruits of the Spirit, right? Paul writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the things that grow in our lives as you and I better align ourselves with God's purpose. See, the old is gone and the new has come. And this is just kind of an aside, but if you ever wonder where you are in your relationship with Jesus, these fruits of the Spirit, they're supposed to be present in all of us as we grow in our relationship with Him. And so you can kind of do a self-test. Am I becoming a more loving person? Do I experience any measure of joy? Is there more peace in my life? Am I becoming a kinder, um, better version of myself? Am, is, is my faith growing or is it stagnant? Am I gentle? Am I able to self-regulate and self-control myself? And if the answer is no, then you gotta ask yourself the question, well, who moved? What are the next steps I need to take? Because this is the life that God has created for us. See, these are the things that grow as we align ourselves with God's purpose. And I, I think that's really good news. Because what, what Paul's saying is, you don't have to be a victim. Like you can choose to step out of that mentality. You're not a victim, you are a victor. That's who God created you to be. I've learned about this by hanging around our recovery community. Meets on Thursday nights. 
And um, it's literally for anybody, right? Like people with hurts or people who've got habits in their life or there's some hangups. Whatever you may be going through in your life, recovery of Coke is a spot for you. And it's not just for people with um, drug or alcohol addiction. It's, it's really for everybody. Um, it's for people who, family members of those who are wrestling with addiction. It's um, people who have got really tough pasts or people who are wrestling with codependency or, or maybe it's, it's just people who are angry and frustrated by life or people who've experienced brokenness or trauma. These are the people that show up on Thursday nights. And listen, it's a blast. There's food, there's worship, there's share groups. It's a safe place. It doesn't cost you anything. And you'll leave encouraged. So one of the things they often do is they hand out these chips. And um, people will often get them at the end of one month or a year or five years, 10 years, whatever. And um, people get one of these. And they carry them with them wherever they go. Now, why would they do that? It's because it's a reminder, right? They get a chip to celebrate that they've made it a certain amount of time and they're still sober and they're still together. But more important than that, I think it's a daily reminder that the old life is gone and the new life has come. When they look at that chip, it's a reminder that we're not the sum total of our mistakes and our failures. It's that reminder that if God can forgive me, then God can forgive anybody, right? That if God can work in my life or the life of my family, then God can work in anybody's life. It's a reminder that if God can provide for me, then he can ultimately provide for anybody. But it's also a reminder for the person that carries it that they're on a mission and that their mission is to join with God and help rescue other people to find freedom. See, you and I are rescued to be a rescuer. We weren't placed on this earth to take up space. It's not like God just created us, brought us into this world and set us loose and said, well, okay, now you just sort of live your life and you go do you. There's a specific reason that every single one of us was brought into this world. And that is to rescue other people. And so the first principle from 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 is simple. Celebrate God's rescue. Now, there are a lot of things that I celebrate in my life, but there are also a few things that are basically like triggers of non-celebration, right? One of those triggers for me is flying. Like, I love to travel, but I absolutely hate getting on an airplane. I don't like the crowds. I don't like the long lines. I don't like the discomfort of those small seats. I don't like facing potential delays. And on top of that, I'm really not that jacked up about the impending death, right? The last time I flew, I was going to a conference in California. And um, I left from here in Knoxville, so I hopped, hopped on a plane, went from here to Atlanta, and then got on another plane in Atlanta, and it was a direct flight to California. And it was a fascinating deal. Once I got on the plane in Atlanta, um, we were getting ready to take off, and the lead flight attendant comes on, right? And she was from Hawaii. And in Hawaii, they have this word, it's the word mahalo. This means like esteemed or thank you or gratefulness. It's, it's mahalo. I like this word. So she comes on the intercom and she's like, we're gonna be taking off now. It's about a six hour flight. It's gonna be great. Just sit back and relax, mahalo. And I was like, yeah, I like this, mahalo. And so we take off and we reach our cruising altitude and she comes back on and she's like, well, now, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached our cruising altitude. You're free to move around the cabin. Mahalo. Mahalo. I like this word. Everything is mahalo. And I began to think to myself, you know what? I can do this. This is going to be great. She's right. Mahalo. Well, at some point, very soon after this moment, there's some dude in the back of the plane that starts to show out a little bit. He was being belligerent because he didn't think he should have to pay $12 for a blanket. And I can still remember the announcement. She comes on, ladies and gentlemen, we've had an incident. We're gonna be turning the plane around and returning to Atlanta, mahalo. And I thought to myself, well, this is not gonna be much fun. I don't wanna go, I'm, I'm trying to get this flight over with, right? 
So sure enough, we go around, we get back to the land and the plane lands. And they take this guy off and like, we're, we're legitimately climbing all over the seats, trying to get a view to watch this thing happen because it was epic. So they take care of the situation. She eventually comes back on and she's like, um, ladies and gentlemen, things are under control. We hope to be on the runway for about an hour and then we'll be on our way. Mahalo. Great. Okay, whatever. So we're about an hour in and she comes back on. We're so sorry. Our pilot is timed out, so we're gonna ask you to return to the terminal. Once a new crew arrives, we'll allow you to reboard the plane. Mahalo. And I'm like, oh no, this thing is going south. Like, I don't wanna be here anyway. I'm starting to think to myself, I should have just left a week earlier and actually driven myself to California. But I'm committed, I'm here, I've gotta get out there. So we finally are able to get back on the plane. And I am way too far into this. And and I'll be honest, I was completely freaking out. We finally get back in the air and I'm I'm honestly just sitting there in the chair, right? I'm trying to hold things together. I'm actually starting to walk back and forth and I'm talking to myself and I'm just like, oh man, mahalo, mahalo, right? Just trying to hold it together. Well, finally we land in California and I made the decision right there. That's gonna be the last time that I flew on a plane because I just could not take it. But I thought about that a lot. I like that word. It's this idea of thanks or gratitude. It changes everything in life, especially when you anchor into it spiritually. When you're going through something and it's it's hard and you get to that place where it feels like the walls are closing in around you, that's the moment it ought to be mahalo, right? That's the moment we ought to go to. Thank you, God. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your rescue. Thank you that I'm not alone. Thank you that you've forgiven me. Thank you that you've given me the gift of eternal life. Thank you that right now in this moment, your Holy Spirit is present with me, guiding me and leading me and strengthening me. See, never forget to celebrate God's rescue in your life. Every day, learn to give thanks for all that he's done. Because when that becomes a regular part of who you are, I promise you, it helps us begin to push back against the voices that are in us and around us that are always trying to tear us down. It is literally mahalo, learning every day to say thank you back to God. There's a second principle that I think is equally important. And that is, Learn to share God's grace. Just learn to share God's grace. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says this, and all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task. We're on a, we've got a task, people. God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself no longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. So think about that. God could make his appeal any way that he wanted to, right? Because like, he's God. God could have written it across the heavens. God could have... um, brought the clouds together and written it right there on the clouds. God could have taken over every billboard in every city on the entire planet. But Paul says, no, God's choosing to make his appeal through us. He says in verse 20, so we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. We are God's ambassadors. And listen, when you align yourself with that fact that you are on a mission, no matter what your job is, no matter what title you achieve, no matter what you do to make money, no matter where you go and no matter what you may do, we are all ambassadors. And the message is this, come back to God. Because when you come back to God, you will discover he loves you and he cares for you and he actually wants to be with you. When you and I align ourselves with that purpose, over time, it reduces a lot of the other pain and frustration that goes on in our lives. And listen, 
It does not take much. If you just dial into the idea that God has you on a mission of reconciling people to himself, like if you'll just carry that in your heart, even a little bit, you'll be surprised at how God can use you in a powerful way. And I'm talking about simple little stuff. I'm talking about the power of a smile. I'm talking about speaking a kind word. I'm talking about a simple act of grace. I'm talking about a simple act of generosity, an invitation to attend church with you. I'm talking about an act of compassion. I'm talking about something so simple as just making yourself available in the moment. That can make a massive difference in somebody's life. I wanna leave you with this. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Hacksaw Ridge. Man, it is a fantastic movie. It's based on the real life story of Desmond Doss, who was the only individual in World War II who was a conscientious objector to firing a weapon and yet went on to win the Medal of Honor. He didn't want other people going to fight for our country without him being there, so he signed up and he went as a medic. And listen, this is a powerful movie. And it captures so much of what he went through, right? Like you get, a, you get a peek into basic training and then you get a peek into what it was like when he went to actually start fighting. You see how other people in his unit looked down upon him because of his beliefs. And there were all these people who were constantly questioning his motives. Here's a person going to battle without a weapon. And there's this moment in the movie that's actually true to what happened in real life. I've since seen a video of him explaining this moment and it was exactly like the movie. They're on this ridge called Hacksaw Ridge and they were trying to take control of it. But the enemy was really strong and they were well equipped and they were prepared for the moment. So eventually they get wiped up and they end, uh, get wiped out and they end up having to retreat. Like everybody has to go back down the ropes, down the cliff and they end up pulling out completely. Everybody leaves, but Desmond stays. And as a medic, he's running around. There's all this gunfire, all these bombs going off, and he's trying to rescue as many of his unit as he possibly can. Like, his whole group left. It was time to cut and run, but he just kept trying to grab as many of his friends as he could. And so what he ended up doing is he would patch them up as best he can, and then he would grab them and he would pull them over to the edge of the ridge and he would tie a rope onto them and he would lower them down to safety. And by the end, he's completely covered in blood. He's totally exhausted. He did this all night long into the next morning and he ended up saving 75 people. And there's this moment that he confirmed that I thought was really powerful. He said, every time I got back and I lowered one over the edge, I'm exhausted, my hands are bloodied by the rope. I would say, just one more, Lord, just give me one more. And he'd get back up and he'd head back out and he'd try to find another one. And each time, same thing, Lord, just give me one more. And I've thought about that movie for a long time. And I thought about it from a spiritual standpoint. If there would be one central prayer that I have for me and I have for you, and I have for every single person that's connected to this church, it would be that prayer of, Lord, just give us one more. Like God does the saving, right? But that we get to partner with him in the process. It's not because we're better. It's because we've experienced the same rescue in our lives. I mean, if you think about it, all a Christian really is, it's just one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And so here's what I've been doing starting this week. Every day at 1 p.m., I'm actually praying for one person in my life who's really far from God. It's pray for one at one. And I like to challenge you, wherever you're watching from, whatever city you live in, to join me for the next 30 days and just pray for one at one. You can set an alarm on your phone. And what that means is, you gotta start looking around in your life. Who is it in my life that is really far from God? And listen, I know things are crazy right now. I know that we're in the middle of a fourth wave and depending on what part of the country you're in, it is an absolute nightmare and I know things are scary. 
But one thing you can do is you can stop and you can pray. And I'm asking you, as many people who will, is to join me every single day at one to pray for just one and believe that God is gonna bring that one to us. And then my prayer is that we'll have the strength and the courage to step into that conversation because you never know what a simple act of kindness, a smile, making ourselves available in that moment can do for that person's life. And the reason I know this will work is because it happened in my life. It was just someone who cared enough about me to make themselves available, to walk with me through my life, to show me the way. It was literally one beggar telling another beggar where I could find the bread of life. And y'all, it's made all the difference in the world. I say it all the time. When I look back over my life, I can honestly say that everything in my life that is good, it's because of Jesus. And the call is, for those of us that have had that experience, is to partner with God to share the rescue we've received and be a rescuer for somebody else. I don't think that God has given up on this world. I think that he's given every single one of us a mission and a task. We are ambassadors wherever we are in our life. And it's our job to show somebody else the way. And so I just wanna ask you to join me. Pray for one at one. And in 30 days, let's get back together and let's celebrate all that God has done. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.